So before we start, I do have a second channel. So if you are interested in more content that isn't related to anime and manga, consider going over there and subscribing. Also, if you end up enjoying this video, consider leaving a like. I'd greatly appreciate it. So I have talked about Tokyo Ghoul, I have talked about Kaneki, why not go a little bit further and talk about some of the specific characters that I absolutely love and adore. Now obviously this is just one of the many, but specifically for this character, the way they're handled, the way they're introduced, the impact, the dynamic, the overall power and intensity, the monstrous aura that they bring across is something completely out of this realm. It's something that is very captivating and enthralling and kind of puts you on the edge of your seat every single time that they are shown within the manga. What I appreciate about this character uh, is more so their architecture, because writing a character like this can be an extremely lopsided uphill battle, and if there isn't enough attention, enough appreciation, and enough understanding of the value, the true value that they actually uphold, it can crumble legitimately within your hands, and you can watch it fall apart and scatter itself throughout the story, almost being impossible to pick back up. This character is obviously none other than Arima, so let's begin. In all honesty, I want to keep this nice and simple. There is two specific things that I want to focus on today in regards to Arima as a character. That is the overall power and the monstrosity of it that he upholds, the value of it, but also his dynamic and a relationship that he forms with the main character. When I remember Arima, when I think back and connect to how he was influencing the story, his true intention, his motive, to put simply, the things that flood my mind is the intensity of it. This character was not a joke. This character was someone that you did not want to mess with, and every single time you seen them within the manga, you knew something was about to change. Something was about to go down. And honestly, it wasn't a fair fight. Arima was powerful. He was obnoxiously strong and skilled, and it finessed everyone within his path with ease, without breaking his sweat. You never seen any sort of emotion over his face. Nothing was influencing his actions. He was clear, precise, but still had this intensity about himself and it kind of fueled back into itself because of it. Because he didn't show this emotion, because he was so clean and precise, it made the intensity of his emotions and the monstrous aura that he upholds even more prominent, even more unpredictable. Do you see how all of those facets kind of contradict one another but also kind of fuel in to create a much bigger picture? They work hand in hand and with the way Ishida kind of built Arima's architecture as a character, this worked extremely well and efficiently. I'm pretty sure everyone that read Tokyo Ghoul or experienced Tokyo Ghoul to some sort of level remembers Arima for that fact. He's just someone you didn't want to mess with. When you were writing a character that stands above everyone else, that is completely unpredictable and powerful and just sits right at the top, is the ceiling cap for power. There is so many difficulties that come into play, so many hurdles that you have to jump over, so many things that you have to be aware and careful of so you don't completely devalue the power scaling within your own story. Especially if this person, which in Arima's case he was, is opposing the main character. We knew Arima had no problem with anyone within this story, so until it was purposeful, until it was the right time, avoiding any sort of interaction with Arima and someone else, or even the main character specifically in terms of a conflict or a fight, was a necessity. You'll probably notice this pretty normal absent for characters that are obnoxiously strong, that face no difficulties themselves. Someone that could single-handedly wipe out basically every character within the story with ease. The more you play upon them, them, the more you introduce them within this story and put them within conflict, the more that value starts to trickle away, the more plot convenience or plot armor starts to show itself. So how do you deal with that? You make it very specific, you make it purposeful. So you, you still have to show this character. You have to show the monstrosity, the aura, the intensity of them itself, but you can't show them too much where it starts to reveal that plot armor. So it's this very fine balance of picking the right moments, the right time and the right characters and to put this character up against and to showcase this intensity, this aura, this fighting or killing intent. 
a very great way that Isha had done this and one that's pretty normal at first is putting them up against pretty simplistic characters. People that you can throw away or kill off without any sort of repercussion but the one that stands out the most, the one that inherently has the most value behind it is the very first Carnegie and Arima fight. When you go into this, which is the finale of the story which is beautiful for a very climatic ending, you don't actually know that this is going to be the final fight. And for me that was kind of the most impressive trickery or intention that Isha Shida went with. He did not announce or propose or even tell anyone that his story was ending. So when we got to that first Carnegie versus Arima fight, it wasn't an ending. It wasn't a climatic final fight, but it was just another encounter for Carnegie to most likely not overcome. Your perspective of that fight would be completely different if you knew the story was ending, if you knew this would be the final fight within it. You would understand that either Carnegie would die and that would be the end of the story or something would change, something would happen to evolve this fight down a completely different direction because there is no way that Carnegie at that point in time, even though he had a lot of power, even though he was going out of control and half cargages are extremely unpredictable, everything that we had seen up to that point for Arima was unmatched, unparalleled, no one was standing up against him. So purposeful trickery done that fight justice. Something that a lot of people don't really recognize because you don't have to, but when you start to kind of peel back the layers of the story itself and its actual fundamentals, progressing down this route with so much purpose and intent amplifies that fight tenfold. From this, you also get to see the reality of the situation. That even though half Kargages and Carnegie out of control and completely fighting at his hardest with losing himself within this insanity stands no chance whatsoever against Arima. That fight for a lot of people probably lives rent free in your head. Arima did not care. He did not show any sort of fear or any sort of resistance. He fought Carnegie head on with the intention of killing him, but there was a purpose. There was something there that was hesitant within Arima and you don't actually know this perspective or this thought process till within Tokyo Ghoul Re where the story changes and the identity of a Carnegie becomes a much bigger thing and the future of Ghouls, CCG and the whole world that is Tokyo Ghoul in itself kind of opens up to a much bigger scale and Arima is the kind of head person leading all of it. He is the one molding and contorting and bringing up the new future. He's crafting it within his image. This ultimately leads into the birth of the dynamic between Arima and Carnegie, or should I say Hayase. Now that we have changed perspectives, now that we have jumped towards the CCG and Hayase is a high profile investigator, we can have a closer human connection to Arima. We can potentially start to understand him, we can start to see the more normal side of Arima. Before we were on the opposing end, we were on the killing intent end, we were on the opposite side of the blade. But now we are within his inner circle, now we are within his vicinity, we can talk to him, we can explore his depth as a character, his mindset, his emotions, etc. So you could easily say that Tokyo Ghoul put Arima on this power showcase, this level that is completely untouchable that no one will ever get to, and then Tokyo Ghoul re props up the other side. For me, this relationship is extremely beautiful. It's actually one of my favorite, and there's a very good reason for it. Ikaniki's past, before he was a ghoul, wasn't the brightest. It wasn't sunshine and rainbows, to put simply. His mother was heavily abusive and she was very mentally and emotionally not only taxing for Carnegie but also manipulative in that sense she was very unwell and Carnegie's father was absent from his life. Till this day we don't know who Carnegie's father was and it is completely irrelevant that we ever find out who it is but there is genuine purpose in leaving his father out completely as this void can actually be filled. See when Carnegie's mother passes away the passing or her death is kind of skewered in a different light. See, Carnegie still loves his mother, he still appreciates, and you can kind of argue that this is uh, a trauma response, not understanding his own trauma, his own past, and what he's actually been through, so he still feels guilt. And at the beginning of the story, you can kind of see that guilt still there where he blames himself for a lot of different things. I mean, throughout the entirety of the story, a lot of the things that his mother potentially put him through is what he reflects within the manga. He takes all of this burden, all of these issues, uh, which is directly correlated to his trauma, to his past. Something that he has not actually processed or self-recognized. He hasn't healed from it. It's also a big reason why he struggles with women and approaching it. So Carnegie and Toka's romantic relationship 
is a very massive step for him. But what does any of this have to do with Arima? Arima does something that is completely absurd for his character. One, because you could never see it coming based on how he's been visualized throughout the story, but two, the genuine authenticity behind it. Arima treats Hayase as a son, and Hayase or Carnegie sees Arima as a father. This is something not to be taken lightly, not only because of the context that I provided just before regarding Carnegie's past and his upbringing and his absent father and his mother and his trauma, but also because of Arima's origin, the family that he comes from, being a sunlit child, a failed one at that, that is sterile, that can't actually have children of his own, but also the prospect of changing the world and directing it down a path to something potentially better, basically handing over the crown or the keys to his successor. This is the genuine heart of the Carnegie Hayase slash Arima dynamic, their relationship, their father-son bond, and it gets pushed to its absolute limit. What's great about this, however, what is so genuine about this approach is that Hayase invokes so much emotion, so much appreciation within Arima. There is times that you see him show emotion that he has never shown within the story. You can genuinely tell that he cares about his son. Something that was turned from a project, an idea, has now turned into a genuine love and appreciation for that person. Mind you, Arima is known as a person that does not show emotion and that is not influenced by those things, but you see that so directly and so strongly when he spends time with Ayase. So at this point, leading up to the final moments of their relationship, you were pushing two things, and we actually know this. The first is that Arima has some sort of plan to change the CCG, to change the girl world, and to push a whole new generation forward. And it is within the form of a very specific title, the One-Eyed King. As the person or ghoul that has this title, that is recognized as the most powerful or influential being to exist within the ghoul world. So the final fight you get is actually the second thing, the maturing point, the relationship. And you see that fight in all of its glory. It is one that is as serious as it needs to be. And what I mean by this, Arima could have easily killed Kaneki within this fight, but he only pushed as hard as what Kaneki needed to test him, to bring him to his limits, to make sure that he was ready. At this point, Arima was running out of time. He needed Hayase or Kaneki to evolve. And if he didn't push past that half Kagaja, if he didn't push past that mentality, he would not be fit to be the One-Eyed King. There is a moment within this fight, however, that Arima knew that Kaneki would go about it a different way. That the way that Arima wanted to do it, or the uh, kind of hypothetical he most likely ran throughout his own mind, was actually wrong. It was right in the sense of pushing Kaneki to a limit, but the mental gymnastics that Kaneki would do within that fight actually made a lot more sense, and the end product was a lot more profitable. And it's because of that coincidental relationship that they actually built over that time period, something that I assume Arima did not actually expect. This compassion, this love, this appreciation, even for a person that's trying to kill him, even for a, a fatherly figure that Carnegie is looking up to saying that he no longer cares about his son. It worked gloriously, not in the way that Arima envisioned it, but in one that was arguably better. If Carnegie did not change, if he did not evolve, if he did not push past the barriers of his own mind and his own emotions and to turn into that one-eyed king, Arima most likely would have killed him then and there. He easily had the power to do so, but he took his own life because he realized he was finished. He realized that Carnegie did successfully transform and evolve and that he was no longer needed and for the title to genuinely be a thing and to take out the ceiling of power that has been established throughout the entirety of Tokyo Ghoul, Kaneki needed to free himself from Arima and to let him spread his own wings. The more I think about that fight, the more beautiful and iconic it truly is. It's honestly such a magnificent and impressive fight. It's a fight of emotions, it's a fight of power, it's a fight of evolution. It's everything but just a physical altercation or a showcase of power. There is so much genuine emotion within there that you can appreciate and fall in love with and it only works it's only possible because of how Arima has been perpetuated throughout the story because of his betrayal because of his character because of where he comes from and the things that he's experienced but also that understory but also Carnegie 
his past, his trauma, his experiences, what he went through within the early stages of becoming a ghoul. For me personally, till this day, the dynamic between Carnegie and Arima is one of my favorites. I absolutely love it. I adore it. I appreciate it. And Arima as a character specifically on his own is so incredibly well handled with so much intent. It's very specific, it's very purposeful, and every time you see him, it's not without reason. For me, he is fundamental to the story that is Tokyo Ghoul and Tokyo Ghoul Re. He plays a pillar of power, a father figure, a dynamic, a plan, or prophecy, a king. He plays so many different roles that influences and changes the story. It completely recontextualizes your perspective and changes it into something that you would never expect. And I, for one, couldn't be more appreciative of his character, his worth, his value, and what he should have truly gave us with him. End time. So welcome to the end of the video. If you have made it this far, I want to thank you. I appreciate you. But I would love to hear your thoughts on Arima. How do you feel about him? Did you love him within Tokyo Ghoul or Tokyo Ghoul Re? Do you appreciate the dynamic between him and Carnegie? Or do you more so love the monstrous aura and the intensity of it every single time that he appeared? I'd love to hear your thoughts. With that, I want to thank you all for watching. Hope you enjoyed. Leave a like and subscribe. I really appreciate it. Drink plenty of water and I will see you within the next one. Goodbye.